Elie Wiesel reminds us that the question is not why Jews didn't fight, but how many did. Tormented, beaten, starved, where did they find the strength, spiritual, physical, to resist? By the end of 1940, the Germans had herded half a million Jews into a densely crowded Warsaw Ghetto and sealed them off behind massive walls. Food was scarce, disease rampant, and before long, ghetto Jews were dying at a rate of 5,000 people a month. Then in the summer of 1942, 300,000 ghetto inhabitants were resettled from Warsaw to Treblinka. And of the original half million, less than 56,000 remained. As the deportation continued, word filtered back to the ghetto that railroad cars were returning from Treblinka, empty. And the people of the ghetto sensed that their time was limited. But then, the youth of the ghetto formed the Jewish fighting organization, the ZBO, and under the leadership of 24-year-old Mordecai Anulowitz, the ZBO converted a sense of prevailing despair to a determination to resist. Jewish masses, the hour is drawing near. You must be prepared to resist. Not a single Jew should go to the railroad cars. Among the youth who helped form, found the ZBO was Zevia Lebetkin. Let us stand up against the criminals and, if necessary, die like heroes. If we die in this way, we are not lost. Our slogan must be, all are ready to die like human beings. Critical to the resistance were the couriers, Jews with Aryan features and unaccented Polish, who courageously tunneled through the sewers and slipped through the cracks in the wall. Capture meant execution. And at 19 years of age, Simka wrote him, was the head courier. We smuggled food and weapons into the ghetto. Also, we brought news of ghetto conditions to the outside world. And in 1942, brought back the truth about the resettlement to the East. We came to understand that our time was limited. In January 1943, Himmler visited the Warsaw Ghetto and ordered a final resettlement. The Jewish resistance sprang into action. We set about constructing fortified positions in the sewers, cellars, and vaults which honeycombed the ghetto. We had few weapons, mainly pistols and rifles, homemade grenades and some rifles which we had smuggled in. And when German troops entered the ghetto to organize the resettlement of another 8,000, they were greeted with gunfire. When the Germans entered dark hallways, we hit them and then quickly escaped across the rooftops. They became increasingly cautious, avoiding the cellars. The German action ended within a few days. Believing that their resistance had brought the deportations to a halt, the young Jews fortified their hideouts and strengthened their fighting units in preparation for the next battle. That battle came with spring. As Tobia Oshikovsky, one of the ghetto fighters, later recalled. April 19, 1943, the day before Passover, the first day of spring, sunshine penetrated down into the cheerless ghetto. It's difficult to face death in the spring sunshine. From the balcony above Nalaveskus 33, we watched long lines of Germans forming in the early dawn. Not just Germans, but also Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Polish police, a massive force. The ghetto was surrounded. 
I wondered what we could do against such might, but we refused to admit the approaching defeat. When the first German detachment advanced toward our positions, we opened fire. Our guns crackled, grenades and homemade bombs exploded above their heads as they returned our fire. The battle went on for hours. And then the enemy retreated. It was a triumph to gladden the hearts of men. When we threw those hand grenades and bombs and saw German blood pouring over the streets of Warsaw, there was much rejoicing. Rejoicing at the miracle of those German heroes, afraid, terrorized, and retreating from Jewish bombs and hand grenades. Tomorrow did not worry us. The next day, the Germans attacked a factory area where five of our squads were deployed. We set off a mine, forcing their retreat. When they reappeared, we opened fire and then engaged them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Germans raised a white flag, requesting a 15-minute truce. We responded with a volley of fire. For four days, we held the upper hand. What took place exceeded all expectations. We did more than our strength should have allowed. But now, our forces are waning. We are on the brink of extinction. We forced the Germans to retreat twice, but they have returned stronger than before. The Germans returned and tightened their siege. Electricity, water, and gas were turned off. Police dogs searched for fighters in hiding. Then, on April 22nd, German commander Jorgen Stroop launched a new strategy to burn the ghetto, building by building, street by street. The ghetto burst into flames, one building after the next. Fire raged day and night. We watched helplessly as scores in the upper stories, including women with their children, slid down sheets or jumped to escape the flames. We crowded into the bunkers, thousands of us trying to hide into the cracks of rat holes. In the bunkers, there is no air. It is impossible to light even a single candle. And the heat, the tremendous heat, we could hardly breathe. When we sought refuge in the sewers, the Germans tried to flush us out by flooding the mains, but we stopped the water supply. Then they opened the manholes and filled the sewers with smoke. Our losses are enormous. Our end is imminent. But while we are in possession of arms, we shall resist. Mordecai sent Sigmund and I back to the sewers to make contact with friends outside, to mount a rescue operation. On the night of May 1st, we found a tunnel under Bonifrasca Street leading out of the ghetto. In the early morning, we emerged in sunny area in Warsaw, where to our amazement, life went on as naturally and normally as before. We made contact with friends and delivered Mordecai's last letter. I cannot describe the conditions in which the Jews of the ghetto are now living. Few will survive. Perhaps a miracle will occur and we shall see each other again one of these days. It is extremely doubtful, but I feel that great things are happening and that this action which we have dared to take is of enormous value. On May 8th, Nazi troops surrounded the headquarters of the Jewish fighting force at Mila 18. After civilians in the bunker had surrendered, the Germans forced gas into the bunker. And like their brothers and sisters at Masada, the remaining fighters took their own lives. And on the same day, Simka Rotem, unable to secure any help from outside, re-entered the sewers and returned to the ghetto. At night, I raised the manhole cover and stepped into the dark and silent ghetto. I went to Bunker 22 and spoke the password. There was no answer. Then I went to Mila 18, Again, no answer. It was the darkest night, no lights, but lots of smoke and the awful smell of charred flesh. 
In the street, I came upon a heap of bodies. I heard a cry, and in the heap found a dead mother, still holding her baby. I stopped for a moment and then went on. The Germans had destroyed my people and had robbed me of my humanity. The few of us who survived slipped into the sewers where we met Simca, and we recall Mordecai's words. Anyone who remains alive after the uprising must make every effort to reach the forest and to fight there. Simca led us through the sewers to Aryan Warsaw and into the forest. Later, the Germans boasted of killing or capturing more than 56,000 of us. And of those they captured, they shot 7,000. The remainder were shipped to Treblinka and Lublin. The Germans had planned to liquidate the ghetto in three days, but the resistance, Jewish resistance, held out for 28. The last wish of my life has been fulfilled. Jewish self-defense has become a fact. Jewish resistance and revenge have become actualities. I am happy to have been one of the first Jewish fighters in the ghetto. As the news of the heroic ghetto fighters spread through the underground network, Jews in other ghettos were inspired to resist deportation to death camps. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising would become a defining moment in Jewish history, in Jewish resistance, in Jewish honor.